Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our webinar series, Embracing Change. So we've got Kim calling in from Montana. Thank you, Kim, for being with us early this morning. And uh, an absolute treat, psychotherapist, healer, and uh, magician in his own ways. We always, uh, so we have a really, really beautiful and timely uh, experience that we're gonna have today. Just uh, to let everybody know, those are from, you know, who know Kim very well. I just did my review with his sister, Terry, this morning, which is quite interesting. And here we are today. So Kim, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And um, maybe we just begin with, uh, I don't know, defining ego, defining human development, however you want to begin. Uh, let's, 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 let, let's let the party begin. <laughs> Thank you, Fessel. It's great being here with you. It's been a delight getting to know you and everything. So it's an honor to be here. Hey, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, ego is really, I mean, depending upon what developmental level you're at, you're going to define ego in different ways. Okay. So, <clears throat> I mean, from a, uh, basically, we're inventing our ego all the time. And every time we come up against structures in, in society and life that are confusing or complicated, we have to reinvent our ego. Okay. So, so with each, with each developmental stage, we kind of almost like kill off or dissipate an ego and then we develop a new one and, and we don't really lose the old one. It's kind of held there, you know, in its own way, but, but we develop a, a larger perspective around that. And that becomes our new ego each time we move through a developmental stage. So, so it's, so it's, so it's a, it's a letting go or it's a becoming, or is it a both? Yes, it's both. It's a letting go and it's a becoming. So just to get something that everybody can understand, you know, we've all been uh, children. So if you can imagine like when you were at what stages calls 1.5, this is the toddler running around, getting into things, breaking things, you know, uh, children will hit other kids over the head and take the toy, you know, and, but they'll also love big too, you know, even if you don't want to be loved, they'll come up and love you and they'll grab the mommy's hair and pull the face close and say, I love you. I love you, mommy. You know, and it's not exactly the mommy doesn't get that that feels so loving, but she understands that it's love, you know, even though it's painful because the 1.5 doesn't really get you know, a second person perspective. How does mommy feel when I pull on her hair? The 1.5 child just gets, oh, I'm getting mommy closer to me and that's what I want. And I love her so much, you know, but uh, as, as <clears throat> excuse me, as we uh, have this passion in our life and we're spreading out all over the place, just blowing through boundaries and stuff because we don't even see them. Uh, parents start saying no, start saying no, start saying no. And at some point that ego can't get what it wants anymore. And, and all of a sudden it wakes up to theory of mind, which is, oh, other people have a mind too. Other people have passion just like me. And that gets us into second person perspective where I can put myself in my shoes, first person perspective, but I can put myself in your shoes too, second person perspective. And now we have a whole new ego and a whole new world that we can see. We can see the world of friendship. We didn't see the world of friendship before. We just saw what I wanted. Yeah. But now, you know, at 1.5, you know, I'll hit you over the head to get the toy I want. <laughs> at 2.0, I'll give you the toy so that it can be a friend. And, and that changes the whole world. You see a whole new world and that ego can see a whole new world. We still have the first person perspective because we all kind of have that, oh, I just want it because I want it, right? <laughs> you know? But we also have that second person perspective, which is, you know, I can see, you yeah. know, what you want, what I want, and that, that gets us into cooperation. Okay. And so now we have a cooperative style of connecting and being together. Okay. So this ego keeps growing up and it eventually grows up into leadership styles at 2.0 not much of a leader we're just kind of doing things together at 2.5 we start figuring out these interaction patterns like if i'm kind to you you're kind to me if i'm mean to you you tend to be mean to me <laughs> oh so then we start developing things like oh the golden rule it's like treat others as you would like to be treated and things just go better and now we're starting to get into leadership. We have principled leadership now and this type of, and that's the next ego that arises, right? 
And so we have this, these principles, we start developing more principles. Well, how does this work? How does this interaction work? What are different ways that we can do it? Oh, even if you're not being nice to me, I'm going to be stable and kind because I'm, if I'm stable and kind, you will eventually calm down and now we can have a good relationship. But if you're not kind to me and I'm not kind to you, you know, it doesn't work. It, we just end up getting worse and worse. <clears throat> Keep going. Keep going. I want to. Uh, okay, I'll super. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that after we, yeah. yeah, after we get these principles, uh, what happens is so, so see, each time life gives us challenges and the new ego meets those challenges. So that shift from 2.0 to 2.5 is, oh, I want some stability. You know, I don't want to just go down as soon as my partner goes down and go up as soon as they go up. We're constantly in flux. I want to create some stability. So that, that's what these principles do, these sacred principles, these loving principles, whatever you want to call them. They help create stability. But what happens with a 2.5 style of leadership is I'm going to create another rule, another principle when things go wrong. So now I'm going to create another one. Right. And that works good. Hey, and everybody adheres to it. And I expect everyone to adhere to it. Okay. <clears throat> and that's so that great stick. That's more carrot and stick style or it can be. Yeah, it is. It okay. is kind of carrot and stick. It's, you know, it could be physical carrot and stick, but it could just okay. be emotional. It's like, hey, we're going to shun you if you don't, if you, don't yeah. you know, live up to our group norms. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so we get another rule and another rule, and then something else goes wrong. So we create another rule and then something else goes wrong. We create another rule. So we're still coming from that same ego, right? We're trying to solve the problem in the same way over and over and over, which we do every time, like the <laughs> 1.5 child, right? They try to hit over the head and it doesn't work. So then they try and pull harder and that doesn't work. So they pull harder and faster and that doesn't work. We keep using the same ego style to solve the problem until, right. until we cannot not anymore and we wake up to a whole new way of solving the problem you know so 2.5 is trying to solve the problem by making another rule right but eventually we end up with so much bureaucracy that you can't even move okay and that gives us birth to 3.0 it's like whoa wait a minute rules are guidelines they're not the life itself exactly yeah, yeah. And so we, we start going, I want to be unique from the rules. <clears throat> so we start creating some form of uniqueness. We start saying, well, I, you know, I'm going to not follow all those rules. I want to have enough freedom to breathe and be unique and discover who I am. Now, as, as we move away from that structure that gave us all our guidance, right? Now we're kind of stepping into the world of, well, I have to be a little bit my own guidance. Okay. And that can feel insecure. So what happens is we get really good at something. It's what we call the expert stage. I get really good at it. Like I can computer program like nobody's business, okay? Right? And I'm gonna do it perfectly and I'm gonna make sure that it's perfect and there's not one thing wrong with it because I need that perfection. I need that perfection to kind of hold me because the rest of me is kind of playing with life a little bit, stepping outside the box. So we're stepping outside the box but we have something to hold us, that perfectionism. But that perfectionism is inefficient. It takes what, you know, 80, you know, it takes 20% of our energy to get to the 80%, but it takes 80% of our energy to get the last 20%, right? And so what happens is a new leadership is born, and that's the achiever leader, which is we call 3.5. This 3.5 leader goes, wait a minute, I need to be efficient as well as effective you know i need to be efficient not just perfect okay. so so we start going okay this is good enough the 80 20 rule comes in okay. i'm gonna get the 80 percent right i'm gonna let the last 20 percent work its way through okay. which is really good in business because now i can um i can not only do good enough but i can get my business moving if i waited till everything was perfect then, yeah. i would never get going right yeah. um and so this new style of leadership comes in and it allows for, this is where we start doing our plans into the future. We have our goal, we have our benchmarks, we get feedback mechanisms. We create this linear system. It's got multiple loops in the system for complexity, but, it, but it's all headed towards a specific goal. Okay. And so this is where most of our really great business business people come from they're in this 3.5 business world and they you know get really good at creating 
a, a vision of the future. Okay. And then they create all the plans and benchmarks and goals and sub goals and everything to get to that vision of the future. And then they, they get there and they bring their company there and they do fantastic work with that. And this is, this is really good. The, the, the 3.0 can't do that so well because they're, they get too focused in on the perfection, right? And they can't see the bigger picture. They can't keep track of it. So this is where all this great business leadership that comes in um, in the world today. Now, the thing about 3.5 is, is we will continue again, like every ego, just keep trying to do more of it. So once we reach our goal, we might find, oh, I'm not fully satisfied. Oh, that just means I need to reach a higher goal. Instead of making a million, I need to make 10 million. Instead of 10 million, I need to make 100 million. Instead of 100 million, I need to make a billion. Why is this not working? I'm not any more fulfilled. I'm very rich. I'm meeting all my goals. Why am I not fulfilled? And so then it's like, oh, I need to think about my thinking a little bit. Yeah, I can vision into the future. I can plan. I can make you know, benchmarks and goals and create these incredible successful systems and I can replicate them over and over and over again. But something, something isn't very fulfilling. And what's more is all the people that work for me hate me, <laughs> maybe, or maybe they like me, but there's some that hate me, you know, there's, in, there's, in you know, my case, in, in my case, they hated me, but they couldn't ignore me. So that's right. Yeah. That <laughs> it was a tough thing. one. <laughs> it's a tough it was situation. a chicken egg. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we start thinking about our thinking and going, well, let me take a look at this thought. What, what is it? You know, maybe I start going, wait a minute. I want to achieve in relationship. I want to achieve in, in friendship. I want to create community that's, that's bigger and better. I don't want to just, it's not all about this one thing. So we start thinking about our thinking and feeling about our feeling. And then we start going, wait a minute people don't just want to work for me, for my goal, you know, they want to have an experience in life. And we start focusing on corporate culture then. That moves us into 4.0. If I create a corporate culture that is welcoming, warm, loving, supportive, that I care about everybody, then what happens is people actually do want to work more for me. I retain my best help. You know, My best help doesn't leave because somebody else is paying more. Okay. They might pay more, but my best help stays anyway because they love working here. And so corporate culture becomes really important. That's our move into 4.0. That's a whole new world of viewing corporate and leadership. So now I start wanting to create nice, uh, create work as a life experience. Okay. I can create work as a life experience, you know, a fulfilling life experience. Then what happens is, the best people want to stay with me, whether I can pay them more or not is irrelevant. A lot of times people yeah. will stay because even if it is less money, because it's a great place to work yeah. and people love it. And you love it. People love it. The corporate culture is getting set up and we're doing all of that. And that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, but and, 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 all, and these two, these last two leadership styles, Fessel, are, are absolutely wonderful. And you really don't need to go beyond them uh, in most situations, unless you happen to be in a rapidly changing world. Oh, God. <laughs> are you so, referring to something called COVID or that doesn't matter? <laughs> <laughs> that, little, that little element that kind of threw us, uh, threw us off a little bit? That's right. COVID and, and the internet. Yes. You know, people are coming up with ideas so fast now that if you read a book that's 10 months old, it's old news. It's, it's out of date, right? So we are in a rapidly changing world. If you think back just 50 years, just before the internet even, you know, you have stable businesses like Coca-Cola, you know, I'm doing my product. I'm doing my, you know, we're doing our achievement thing. We don't need later than 3.5 to run Coca-Cola. We're not in a rapidly changing world. We're not in a rapidly changing business. So if I create a really good business plan, it's going to work. Yeah, it's going to stick. I, yeah. It's going to stick. I'm going to just, and I just replicate, you know, yeah. but now what happens with the internet, with disruptive technologies becoming almost the norm. If you're in a field with disruptive technology, you can still probably run Coca-Cola with a 3.5 or 4.0 and do fine, right? You know, but if you're in a rapidly changing thing like 
anything to do with the internet, anything to do with the way culture's changing. Um, um, and also even in Coca-Cola, you know, with all the people changing so much, you know, you're going to want to start moving to a later, more quickly adaptive leadership style. And that brings us to 4.5. 4.5 leadership style is complex adaptive systems. How do I create a complex adaptive system? Because I, as the leader, am not going to be able to keep up with it all. And I can't just replicate an old linear system because it's just going to create the old linear system. And now the world's changed. And now it's not matching the world anymore. So with a complex adaptive system, we are noticing how the world is changing, how things are changing all the time, how people are changing and growing. And I need to create a system of systems, not just a system, but a system of systems that inter correlate and interwork together in ways that are getting feedback from the external world, how the world's changing so that we can be on the cutting edge all the time. Okay. A, a stable linear system like 3.5 cannot be on the cutting edge all the time. You can create, get people in that are on the cutting edge, but the system will not be able to adapt to that change fast enough. Okay. Okay. So what, what kind of companies would be at that level right now, you know, systems of systems? I mean, if you can give some examples. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Google is playing with that. I think, you know, Apple is doing that. Different corporations like this, notice how they've set up these corporate cultures that try to make it really enjoyable for the people. They have free time, they have relaxed time, but they're still on, on task, you know, working in different ways. They have more flexible hours, more flexible work environments, <clears throat> but they're also doing this 4.5. We have all these different pods that are working and they're all have their fingers in different parts of the world and we're interconnecting and then working in pods and interconnecting and they are adapting very quickly to the changing world. And that's why they're on the top of their game. That's why they're the leaders in the field. Okay. And then what happens? So after after google is there more or that's it it's time to go there there is more but it's really time to go no the, the problem with the, that's right <laughs> we can say that there are more advanced leadership styles and there are for sure but in our current culture 4.5 is really the pinnacle if you go to the next one we get into strange experiences like construct of mind and how the mind is con constructing things all the time. So we tend to start tearing things apart more than putting things together. You know, at 5.5, we come back and we put things together and we can be a good leader again. But this is something for leaders to re realize is that as you move from say your leadership style of 3.5 to 4.0, you can lose efficiency even while you're building corporate culture. And, you, and it's easy to get a little bit lost on the leadership again till you get to 4.5 where you can see that again. So a lot of people carry their 3.5 leadership well enough to move them through 4.0 until they get to 4.5, which is oh, another okay. active okay. style. Okay, well, the same thing happens from 4.5 to 5.0. You kind of go into this place of, I just want to tear this all apart. Uh, this this is not me. This we, is not the way to live. <laughs> we, we call it control all delete. And that's from yeah. our- most, most people on the call don't even know what that means. <laughs> yeah, control alt delete. That's exactly what it is. It's control alt delete of the mind. I'm gonna reshape my entire mind here, you know. But the, the advantage of it is when you get to 5.5 .5, then in, in business leadership, I mean, yeah. 5.0 has its own wonderful value just in and of itself. But when it comes to leadership, your mind is just operating much quicker now. <laughs> so because it doesn't things. have... Yeah, what, it, what, is it see things around the corner? Like what, what, in what way does it, is it faster? Well, what happens is we have all these thoughts and beliefs that kind of constrain our thinking up yeah. through 4.5. You know, they're loosening up They're You know, we're thinking about our thinking, we're getting more flexibility, yeah. but there's a lot of thoughts, beliefs, orientations, and just how the mind works, how the human mind tends to work that keeps it a little bit constrained. And, and what happens at 5.0 is we start deconstructing all that more and more oh, okay. uh, until, until you are in what we just call pure awareness or awareness of awareness. Okay. So awareness of awareness, awareness just moves a lot faster than thought. Okay. 
So up until this point, we've been in thought and in awareness, but we're but the awareness is still constrained by thoughts. And what happens at 5.0 is the thoughts fall away at a much more rapid pace. And we're just in awareness and in awareness. Um, how do I describe this? So when you look at a tree, you see a tree, yeah. but in awareness, you see that specific tree at that specific moment with that specific light, with that specific lichen on it and all the details really come into vivid focus okay. and, and awareness. You're seeing the uniqueness of the moment. And, and what happens with that is, and for a leadership perspective, is you see not the construct or the concept that I have of my business, but what's really happening in all the nuances and details. You just see it because you're not filtering it with the concept. Okay. And it's a concept falls away. Yeah, go ahead. So you have a presence and an awareness that it's not even like you just wondering where that came from, even though you kind of know, but don't know. Yeah, yeah you... right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so for our leaders that start moving into 5.0, sometimes there's a bit of a, a problem because you're, you're deconstructing and you're not constructing. And so you need to borrow from your 4.5 enough to keep things going well. And then when you get to 5.5, then things snap really fast. And but it's you or you need to put a team around you while you do that or you can so, yeah that's a great idea you know a team around you really helps you know and you need to be able to trust that team uh, a lot of times what people want to do at 5.0 is just quit everything quit their business quit their marriage quit their <laughs> quit their life and just just kind of step in, in into the a complete unknown for a while and, and see what emerges you know and sometimes that can be kind of devastating for the companies, the families and things like that. So uh, really giving yourself time and space to be able to set up a, a stable structure, like you said, the team around you so that you can just kind of go through this, this phase of, of kind of letting all the concepts and constructs fall away so that you can just see things clearly uh, and directly. That, that sounds like too much alternate nostril breathing. Kim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Add too much oxygen to the brain. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. So, so in terms of in terms of 5.5, I mean, are there examples? I mean, somebody like Steve Jobs, or I don't know, I, I didn't know him that well, but so is, is is there any living example that you would feel would be someone that we could we could think about or 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 reflect on, or is that really too personal and we wouldn't be aware of? of, of uh, well, I don't know of any. I, I can't say that I've, you know, gone through all the different corporations and researched their top executives to see if there are any. So I, I just don't have that information. I would say 4.5 is kind of the pinnacle for leadership yeah. today. Okay. There's obviously some like, you know, Terry O'Fallon, who you just connected with, you know, yeah. who's clearly in these later places. And, but I think that this is really more the experimental stage. There's so few people at these right. places that, that it's really more experimental. What would an organization look like yeah. at five, with 5.5 leadership or with a lot of 5.5s? What would it really look like? And that's really kind of what our business is experimenting with too. We have what we call MetaWare retreats, just people that have scored in this area just to see what happens yeah. when just the few people that are in the world at this place what happens when you put them in a room together with nobody else, okay. you know, and, and since there's not a lot of opportunity for people like this to connect with each other, um, they, uh, <laughs> what appears to me to be happening is they don't quite know how to relate. They tend to relate back to a 4.5 style because that's how, because that's, yeah, that's the most that we know. So what's happening is I think at stages we're building that community in place. We're trying, we're seeing what happens if, if enough of these people get together enough of the time, what kind of an organization emerges? And I think that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're on the experimental cutting edge on, on that particular level. Okay, so you, you, you walked us through all the different, different levels, right? So mm -hmm. what kind of, I, I did the review this morning with Terry, right? It was, yeah. it was a beautiful experience. And, yeah. and so in terms of, there were certain elements that came up like projection, right? She, mm -hmm. I didn't answer one of the questions. I wrote dot, 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 dot. Okay. So yeah. basically, you know, I can't stand people 
and then and I don't ever use that kind of language, but right. for whatever reason, and it was it came out as about projection. So that's just an example. So when there are pieces of that human development that are, I don't know what the word is, not formed or still mm-hmm. still have room to grow, right? Mm-hmm. What are the risks in that? Like, what are the risks that, based on your experience, and and because you know we're talking about the ego development and in terms of leadership, right? So. What what have you seen in terms of cracks or, or 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 I don't know the word you use risks or I don't know what the word is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think when we move from active places to pass in terms of leadership, not in terms of life, because okay. moving from an active to a passive in terms of life can be absolutely beautiful, right? Okay. But in terms of leadership, it can be a bit of a problem because leadership by its own definition is to some degree active and leading, right? Okay. <clears throat> So we have, what happens is, as we study development, we notice that we, uh, like the 1.5 takes leadership, but then they have to step back to the boundaries, be had by the boundaries to see the world of friendship, right? To see the pro-social world. They're not pro-social at 1.5, right? (laughs) They're like, every man for themselves is 1.5. I want what I want, right? But then they see the pro-social world. But in a sense, you have to step you have to sit back and receive because you can't figure something out. I mean, if you haven't received it, you can't do anything with it, right? So this is where we take a look at our learning cycle. We have to receive to act. And once we can receive and act, then we can interact. Okay. Right? So you got this process. First of all, I have to receive it. Otherwise I can't do anything. And then I need to be able to figure out how to use it. And then I can interact with it. And then I can create patterns to understand how to use this, whatever it is that I'm playing with in a way that is functional. That's that 2.5 principles to live by kind of a thing, okay? So we receive, we act, we interact, and then we develop principles that function, Okay. okay? So we do that in the concrete tier with concrete things like roads and bridges and things like that. We receive the ideas, we learn how to act on them, we learn how to interact with others to build them better. And then we develop principles that once the principles are established, we can give them to an engineer. The engineer knows the principles, they say do these principles and we do them, okay? We don't have to figure it out, you know, by interacting all the time, we've got those principles. And then we become the expert engineer who says, now I know how to apply these principles in an expert way and I can just do it. But we're entering a whole new world and that's the subtle world, the subtle world of the imagination of truly new creative imagination. So if you look in the concrete world, we can have imagination too. <clears throat> the concrete world is um, uh, up through that 2.5 that I talked about. And we can have imaginations, like we can see a cow, we can see purple, we can see the moon, and now we can imagine a purple cow jumping over the moon, okay? <laughs> But that's we can't Seth, see. That's Seth Godin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Purple yeah. Cow. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, just that's like great. That. Wonderful. I love it. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. So we can come up with incredibly creative imaginations, but we can't see a future plan that hasn't existed yet. We can't see a complex adaptive system. We can't see, you know, those kinds of things. But in third person perspective, we can, and that's that 3.5 leadership. So 3.0, we're kind of just receiving all these ideas. You know, you ever hear the concept brainstorming? Yeah. Yeah. This is what 3.0 really like the brainstorming. It allows all these new ideas to come in. Right. So that's what brainstorming does. It's that receptive, just letting the ideas flow in without any restrictions. Right. And then the three point says, and then what? No, just kidding. Yeah, exactly. Then the leader says, and then what? And 3.5 is like, I want to hold them all. Don't let any of them go, you know? But 3.5 says, okay, let's wean out these things that don't work. Let's create a vision for the future. Let's create benchmarks and goals, right? So now we're, we're taking action on that in a way that's actually functional and effective. So you hit it right on. The leader does say, the 3.5 says, okay, now what, you know? And that's what they do with the now what they make it into something. And that's because they can have this creative imagination into the future of things that have never been seen before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, so that's the subtle world. So, so, okay. So, so all these pieces that are kind of not formed, there's an opportunity to really support, to create, to, to reinforce that foundation that we may have not had as we grew up or as we, 
Is, is, is that the whole idea so that it doesn't create a risk later? I mean, what, what, what is the idea behind it? That's a great idea. So what happens at 3.5 then is we got the goal, we're moving forward, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden we find that we do something that sabotages our business. Have you ever noticed that ever happens? Of course. <laughs> That's <laughs> my job title. I'm That's my right. KPI. My KPI, <laughs> how can I blow up the house? <laughs> exactly, right? So this happens to all of us at 3.5 is it's like we find ourselves, you know, we go on a diet and then we find ourselves eating brownies, you know, and sitting in front and watch doing Netflix for three hours. So, you know, it's like, wait a minute, I has at this goal. Why am I not meeting the goal? And all of a sudden we realize, oh, as we move into, remember when I said we move into corporate culture, we move into our internal culture. We start realizing, oh, we have different parts inside of us. One part wants to have this goal, right? But another part really doesn't. It wants this goal. And if I don't get those two parts together, I'm going to keep going halfway here and then having it sabotaged and going halfway here. And uh -huh. And this is what indecisiveness is too. That's just one aspect of it. Self-sabotage is another aspect of it. But that's what this is, is, is we think that, oh, I just have two different ideas, but it's really like two different egos inside of us that have, and they have their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own impulses, their own desires, their own goals. And what happens is they're fighting in different directions. And all of a sudden we say, okay, hold on. I have to sit back and look at my own internal culture. How am I... Oh, my internal culture is ignore the other person and just do what I want. Remember that 1.5 that I talked about that just wants what it wants? Well, I want you to imagine having two or three of those inside, right? They all just want what they want. At 3.5, that's an echo of 1.5. Only it's on the subtle level. And what we have is we have a bunch of little 1.5s, only have 3.5 capacities, right? They all have their own individual goal and they're all taking us in different directions. So if you find yourself getting pulled in different directions, being indecisive, sabotaging yourself, that's because of this phenomenon, okay? And at 4.0, we start realizing that and we start seeing the internal ego states, you know, is what we call them is ego states. And because we're not one ego, now we're multiple egos. We see that we are multiple egos and we start going, oh, what kind of an internal corporate culture do I wanna have? And when I get that internal culture where they are all loved, all tended to, all cared for, then the whole system starts working. And now when everybody's on board, now when you go to achieve your goal, you really achieve it because everybody's on board for it. But the dictator ego doesn't get to be the dictator anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't get to say, okay, all you guys on board, we're going in this direction, right? It's yeah. got to create a democracy and it's got to step down from the dictatorship role and yeah. say, okay, we're sitting at the round table now and we're all going to have a discussion as equals. Okay. And that means yeah. the goal gets changed. The attitudes yeah. get changed. Everything gets changed based upon the collective, not based upon the dictator ego that we think is I. I'm going to take this a little bit off what we were probably thinking. So, <clears throat> so when I, <clears throat> when I came back after my, my cancer, mm -hmm. I, uh, my, my decision-making completely did a 180 degrees mm -hmm. and I didn't realize it until um, it was pointed out to me by an outside consultant. So I called my team in and I said, how is my decision making? And they were like a little surprised. And I said, come on, speak to me. And they mm -hmm. said, well, pre-cancer, you just made decisions and you were right 95 plus percent of the time. We just went with it. And now it's like a democracy. You don't make any decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I went home and I said to my family, I said, can you please tell me how my decision making is? What do you mean? I said, restaurants, movies, like simple things, right? Restaurants, mm -hmm. movies, holidays, whatever. And they said, yeah, you now come up and give us all the suggestions, but you're never one, you're never the one taking the call. Mm -hmm. So then I went back to my oncologist and this is what I'd like to really have a reflection for everyone who's been through different experiences is I went to him and I said, what happened? And um, he said mm -hmm. that, 
because you went, <clears throat> sorry, it's okay, I'm right here. Because you were put in a situation where you had to choose between life and death, your body went into a state of shock where now <clears throat> you need to relearn decision-making from scratch. And I was like, wow, you've got to be kidding me. And how did that happen? I went to buy a pair of shoes and I went to the same brand I've been buying for de decades. I tried the shoes on and I came home. And the next day I went to wear the shoes. They were the wrong size, Kim. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went to the doc. Mm -hmm. And I said, doc, I just bought the wrong size pair of shoes and I tried them on. What is going on? So help me again. Okay, yeah. So the doc may be right in terms of some things, but I think the doc got it wrong in terms of human development because doctors don't study human development. Yeah. What it looks like to me is that you went from 3.5 to 4.0 in that. You had a disorienting dilemma, the cancer. And this is what happens. This is what makes any shift happen is we get some kind of a disorienting dilemma. It, it, it rocks our world. And we have to see the world in a new light. Now, what happens is <clears throat> we can, when we get a disorienting dilemma, something that we can't just get through in the normal way, there's a couple of things that can happen. We can shadow crash and go to an earlier developmental level and not cope okay. so well. Okay. The other thing we can do is move to a new developmental level that we've never seen before. <clears throat> and, it, and what you did was you moved from that 3.5 to that 4.0 where you started caring about the democracy, you started caring more deeply about what other people are thinking and feeling. You were more about the inner relationship culture than about the goal. And this is what happens at 3.5. I get so focused on the goal that I often don't attend yeah. to other people, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the shift from 3.5 to 4.0 is, oh, wait, the relationship is what matters. I wanna be here. I wanna be present for others. I wanna hear what they have to say. I want a deeper connection because that's going to be, that's more fulfilling than being the leader all the time. <clears throat> well, then I, I got, I got warned by many that my new leadership style is not working. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what often happens for 4.0. Exactly. So we're walking through this perfectly. So what happens is we want to do this democracy, but the whole system is set up with 3.5. And now all of a sudden we're doing this stuff. and it was built around us because we were the 3.5 leader yeah. providing the direction. We are the captain, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and all of a sudden we have this democracy and, it, and it's not working well, not because it wouldn't work well, but yeah. because the entire system, system was, was built. Yeah. set up on a different mechanism. Yeah, different orientation. So that's where we start building a new corporate culture and it takes time to do that to build this new corporate culture that actually attends to people's feelings, their needs, their livelihood, what makes them fulfilled. But once that new corporate culture is built, then you got a team that's dedicated, that's on board and everybody's moving in the same direction with a, with a vivacious passion. And then, and then I start working towards becoming the laziest guy in the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> With the highest level of efficiency of things getting done. So it's uh -huh. minimum input, maximum output. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The really what... wise leader becomes the quiet one at the head yeah. of the table that facilitates the information flow, yeah. but doesn't dictate it. Yeah. Yeah. But that, but that took time. That <clears throat> took time. Yeah. It was, what the doc said was very scary, right? Mm -hmm. Because... You know, and, and you're right, I had the highest marks in terms of execution, reliability, yeah. all of it. And then mm -hmm. the most, like, and I went to Center of Creative Leadership for a review, mm -hmm. Leadership at the Peak. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm sure you're aware of it. And at, when it came to empathy and all the elements was when it was other people, oh, it was all in the 30s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I, so I did a great job on one level and completely... In, inhumane or inconsiderate or whatever word you want to use on the other. Exactly. And that's what happens to us as we move through these stages. Okay. So there's that, there's that disruption. So tell us, I mean, okay, yeah. please, Kim. Yeah. So there's that disruption. And what happens is, you know, the 1.5 and the 3.5 are kind of similar. We're, we're those active narcissists of that, that um, 
the, that uh, uh, um, tier of development. You know, in the concrete tier, the 1.5 is kind of like that active narcissist, but they're delightful and spontaneous and vivacious and everybody loves them as long as we can set boundaries on them. And at 3.5, you know, we love the business. I mean, they're, they're spontaneous. They're doing stuff. They're just going for it. And as long as we can set boundaries, because they will destroy the entire earth if we don't set boundaries on them. <laughs> it's the same thing, right? Or, or, or run out of passport pages, huh? What That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So at 4.0, we start going, okay, we need a global culture that can set boundaries on our 3.5 businesses because otherwise we're all going to die. Okay. We need to, we need to have some kind of a, a, a global understanding of how these systems can operate. And at 4.5, then we can build them, build sustainable, profitable, humane, fulfilling systems that are sustainable for life. So that's the value of going to 4.5 in business leadership because it's probably the corporate world that's going to either decide that the planet dies or, or survives and corporate leaders that go to 4.5 are going to build corporate structures and interconnected corporate structures that that value you know sustainability human human viability planet viability and and all of this and, and probably the governments are not going to be the ones that do this. I think it's the corporations that are going to do it. They're, they're at the leading edge and, and governments are going to try and world governments are going to try, but yeah. probably it's these interconnected, uh, if you think about it, it's the interconnected businesses that actually led to more peace in the world because they started telling the governments, don't attack this, com this country, we got business there. It was the corporations that actually led to more peace in the world in a lot of ways. And so as these corporations get more and more interconnected and, um, and, and start seeing, oh, our corporation isn't going to survive if we continue down the path that we're at because, you know, the global system is going to collapse. They're going to start creating more and more interconnected global dynamics. They're going to put pressure on governments to hold everybody with boundaries, which is exactly what happens from the 1.5 to the 2.0, right? Parents start setting more and more boundaries. We didn't have to set so many boundaries on the 1.5, on the 1.0 child, the baby, because the baby couldn't get into things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on a, on a, on a subtle tier, this is what, what we're looking at is this is the major dynamic that's happening in the world. So, yeah. So we move into this 4.0 and we start seeing global systems. We start seeing global interconnectivity. We start uh, wanting to create businesses that are going to create interconnectivity and sustainability in a way. Um, and, and yet we have to compete because the whole structure isn't set up yet. Yeah. You know? So we know that our corporation is competing to stay viable and that it's creating an unsustainable experience. And at the other hand, we're trying to create dynamics in the world where we can all be held accountable. And you see this, you see corporations saying, yes, come in and set boundaries on the entire, the entire industry. If we all have the same boundaries, now we don't have to compete in a way that's unsustainable. So you see some corporations doing that. These are those ones that have 4.5 and 4.0 leaders are actually going to governments and world leaders and saying, okay. you need to set boundaries on the entire field. If, you know, because otherwise we're in an, a runaway competition <clears throat> and we can see what's going to happen with that. So please set boundaries on us so that we all are held accountable so that we don't have to have the runaway competition. We can compete within those boundaries. And that's going to create a cooperative dynamic, which is going to create an incredibly cooperated, interconnected world that actually um, supports human decency, human connectivity, human viability, vivaciousness and aliveness. So we do that on the global level, but notice we have the internal external mirror happening. We have to do it on the internal level. Otherwise we're going to sabotage it. Okay. We're going to sabotage. We're going to sabotage our business success. We're going to sabotage our success. We're going to go back to dictate to dictatorial type of uh, leadership style. So we have these internal ego states. So that means we come back and look at that. And some of them crashed earlier developmental levels. I just want what I want. I'm going to take it. Right. We have that, you know? And so what we have to do is create an internal system that attends to all of our egos that we've grown up through that are still there, you know, 
that haven't been fully grown up. Yeah. And so we start attending to those so that they grow up so they're not sabotaging us and sabotaging the business and sabotaging the world. Okay. We have a place for them and we hold them. And that's, that, that's that internal world, that internal culture. And as we build that internal culture, we go, oh, this is what this type of a person needs because I see that type of a person inside of me. Oh, okay, so we get to relate to the other Exactly. Okay. We have a deeper empathy, a deeper compassion, a deeper understanding. We go, oh, now I know a corporate culture to build for this type of a person because I see that person inside of me. Yeah. Terry told me this morning and I didn't, I got it, but I didn't get it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. as you do the inner work, you get to understand and be able to relate and have compassion with mm -hmm. the others around you and build culture or whatever you're building in accordance to their ability to relate Okay, beautiful. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, and this is where we get to the other whole half of corporate leadership or business leadership or any organizational, any leadership. And that is that every developmental level person wants a different thing and a different style of leadership. 2.5 wants a bunch of rules. Give me the rules, give me the parameters, tell me what my job is, train me in it, let me do it. Wow. You know? Okay. 3.0 wants, give me the project. This is my expertise. Leave me the fuck alone. I just want to do it. And don't give me timelines because I honor my craft. I am dedicated to my craft and I'm going to be perfect at it. Right. <laughs> and they're going to build these amazing things, but they're not going to do it in a timely way, which means okay. how do we organize our leadership around that? Right. Because we do need to have some timelines. So instead of paying by the hour, because these people will just spend a million hours getting to perfection because they're passionate about it, right? Not because they're wasting time, but because they're just so absorbed in it, right? And so when we understand that, then we build a corporate structure around these type of employees that say, we're paying you a certain amount by the hour, but if you get it completed by this time, you're gonna get this kind of a bonus. And if you meet this timeline, you get even more of a bonus. And if you meet this timeline, you get even more of a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so we create a different corporate structure around this type of person because we can see that person inside of us. We go, oh yeah, I get that perfectionist inside of me that can just get lost in, in getting things perfect because I remember being that way and part of me still is, you know? And a corporate structure for a 3.5, our, 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 uh, our, our leaders, our different leaders of different compartments or different, uh, yeah. different groups within the, within the business, different departments, you know? You know they, want, they want the goal, they have the goal and they're gonna meet the goal and they're gonna get rewarded for it financially. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, what we need to do is provide a financial reward. Well, that's because so many people are 3.5 and that's what they're going for. But the 3.0s don't necessarily respond more to more financial reward. They do to some degree, but they want to have a place where they can just perfect their craft. The 2.5s want a safe, secure system that has nice, clear rules and boundaries around them with good principles. And as long as it's a moral dynamic, they're going to love it, you know? And sure, they want more money, but this structure means more to them. And so the really good 2.5s that you have in your business are going to love that. If you give them a 3.0 environment, they're going to keep say, I, I'm just not happy here. And they don't know where to begin. They don't even yeah. know. Begin. Yeah, exactly. And if you give a 3.0, a 2.5 structure, they're going to say, get me out of here. I want, I don't go anywhere besides here, you know? And if you give a 3.5, one of those two structures, they're going to not like it. So you need so that's what the beauty of 4.5 is, is they start going, okay, I've been through this 4.0. This, this internal, external uh, culture dynamic. And now I'm starting to see systems that play with cultural dynamics in different people. And now what I wanna do is I wanna test people in my company. I wanna see where my division lands. They're ranging from 2.5 to 3.5. Those are the corporate cultures I need to set. I need to set those three types of corporate culture dynamics so that yeah. they can migrate to those styles and be happy in them. Oh, this division is going from 3.5 to 4.5. I have to set these type of corporate cultures for them so that they're going to be happy and fulfilled. And so that's the beauty of 4.5. We start going, okay, I want to know who my people are so I can set corporate cultures. I can't just set one corporate culture. I have to set multiple facets of corporate cultures wow. that people can migrate in and out of as they grow. And now what happens is a 2.5 gets their 2.5 
but they also get exposed to a little bit of 3.0 and then they might go, oh, I want to move into 3.0. Yeah. So these different corporate cultures allow them to start growing up themselves, creating their own development it becomes a, uh, an escalator for, for development as well as for people being happy right where they're at. Many people just stay right where they're at and some people go, oh, wow. I kind of like this 3.0. Oh, I like this 3.0. Oh, I like this 4.0, you know, and they'll just grow up through the developmental thing. And so now the corporate culture becomes not only a much more effective corporate culture for the bottom line, more effective corporate culture for sustainability on earth, much more effective corporate culture for creating meaningful life for a human being, but also becomes the healing environment through which people grow. So, so that means that our HR should be specialized in human development. Absolutely. And not in all the other <laughs> stuff that they supposedly go study. I well, don't even know what in studying. addition to at least. <laughs> in addition to at least. <laughs> I don't know all the stuff they're studying because I've never yeah. had anybody come and explain that we need to, you know, cater these kind of conditions for this type of person we have mm -hmm. in this part of the organization because that's what mm -hmm. works right? In, in, in right. that way. Yeah. Yeah. Your engineering division is probably mostly a 3.0 corporate culture. A, a, their natural tendency would be to create a, a 3.0 culture, right? Yeah. So that one, I'm going to focus a little more on that culture. You know, your secretaries and stuff like that might be a little more of a 2.5. This is just broad. I mean, there's secretaries yeah, yeah. that are 4.5 and, you know, all, they're all over the board. But yeah, yeah. in general, we're just talking about, you know, especially your, your executive secretaries. I mean, they're, they're functioning at really later levels. Yeah. But you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are just doing kind of their mundane routine, right? Yeah. People that are doing what would feel to me like a mundane routine yeah. is a beautiful, intimate experience. I do it, I do it every day. I got yeah. my routine down. It's yeah. beautiful, I like my work. Don't mess with my routine. That's my 2.5s, you know? So we wanna give them that beautiful yeah. routine environment that they love. You know, <clears throat> because that also makes them happy and fulfilled. And that's what keeps them as employees. And it, it's what makes them happy even just for that, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know, the 3.0s, I mean, like I said, so everyone has their own different corporate culture. The 4.0s, of course, want to have round tables where they can discuss and share things, explore their internal world with their external world. And notice how that's having an effect upon the culture. The problem is, is that we can spend our entire time in meetings and never get to the business of doing work. So we need to set, you know, we need to build corporate cultures that allow for some aspects of these, but also set boundaries at times, you know, so that, and that's where I talked about the 3.0, how you can set boundaries on a financial level is through not raising their hourly wage, but keep their hourly wage at a certain level, but create bonuses for timelines, you know, and, and maybe have three different ones, you know, the most, the biggest bonus is for if it's completed, fast, yeah. you know, fastest, but you know, they can kind of make their decision a little bit, but they have to have it done by this last bonus. Otherwise they don't get any bonus. Right. right, right. <clears throat> All right. So yeah. let's, let's try and take a look at some of these questions. So does the move from 3.5 to 4.5 require a crisis like face of experience in your experience, how many people are in 5.0 or higher level, how is this influencing our culture? Okay, that you okay. already, yeah. All right, so uh, you, don't need, you don't need to have a crisis to move into the next developmental level. A crisis can either drop you back to earlier developmental levels or for, force you forward into another developmental level. Okay. But you can, you can move to the new developmental level in two ways. You can do it through pain, like a crisis, <laughs> or you can do it through passion. Okay. Okay. And the passion is if you start going, okay, I'm an achiever in business. What happens if I become an achiever of the heart? What if I want to be the most loving person in the world? What if that's my new goal? Yeah. Right? So when we broaden a developmental level, say 3.5, I want to be an achiever in business. Now I want to be achiever in, in creating a great family. Yeah. Now I want to be achiever in being a great lover. So now I need to really listen to the other person right? That's the feedback mechanism you see in business, right? I want to do benchmarks. I want to have feedback to see how my benchmarks are doing. Now I need to listen to my spouse to see if I'm a great lover. I need yeah. to listen to my kids to see if I'm a great parent, yeah. right? And now all of a sudden we're moving ourselves into 4.0. Okay. We're starting to go, oh, what culture, what family culture, what relationship culture, 
is going to make my marriage great? What family culture is going to make my family and kids great? And now I'm starting to look at my internal world because I've always been the dictatorial leader. Yeah. And now I'm going, oh, wait a minute. Here's my dictator self. Here's my compassionate self. Here's my, you know, all these different selves that we have inside. And now I start listening to them all. And the dictator starts not having to be the dictator all the time. It's like, you know, dictator, you did well for me in this business place. But now that I want to achieve in family, I can't be dictator. Now, it's interesting because we, we have some of our CEOs going through a review of their nonverbal and yeah. seeing the difference mm -hmm. of the usage of the nonverbal even hand, right? Doing like this, right. like that yeah. at home versus at work. And yeah. at home, it means A, but at work, it's effective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that, that dichotomy, right, of, right. of how do you move? And, and mm -hmm. I know some of them are in the space you're referring to. And it's interesting to see that they're, even the nonverbal is matching to what you're, yeah. what you're sharing, right? Because yeah. that's, that's expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And what happens is we, have a, we kind of think of ourselves as the same person, but sometimes when we go to a different environment, we're a little bit different person. Ever notice that in our life? We're a little <laughs> bit different person at a party than we are at work, than we are with our kids, than we are with our spouse, right? We, we, we adapt and change. And what happens is these ego states, you know, one comes on and comes a little bit more active. Another one comes a little more active. Another one, be because we do better in this environment from here. Right. And, and, you know, in a lot in from 3.5, we just say, Oh, I'm just changing myself to be in this other way. But from a 4.0 perspective, we see these kind of ego structures that rise and fall and percolate through our life, you know, oh, this one comes out and my whole personality tends to match that because it's coming from that developmental level of that ego state. And this ego state arises at work. And now, so I come from that ego state. And, and we actually have done research. I mean, these different ego states can have different illnesses, different allergies. And if well, you're not in that ego state, the allergy goes away. <laughs> Seriously, <Okay. laughs> we've done that. It's, it's crazy if you think about it. But, you know, we've done hypnotic work and we know these things are true. This is part of the scientific research, you know, that you can hypnotize somebody into a different ego state and they'll have a completely, they'll, they'll not be, they'll, they'll be able to eat strawberries, you know, in that ego state, but not in, not in the other not one. Not in the other. No, but you're right. There's, it's, it's true. I mean, when in the hypnotic state, a lot of things shift that are exactly yeah. the same, but, we just, but you're talking about from an ego state, not, I don't know, I guess it's. And a hypnotic you know, state is nothing more than calling on an ego state that's in hiding. Oh, wow. That's what it's doing. We See, have these ego states that we buried, you know, I, I'm a business leader. I need to do this, you know, yeah. and, and, and another one that comes up, it says, oh, but you need to really listen to people. Shut up. Be quiet. I, I need to get my goals. Right. <laughs> so the more we tell that little voice to shut up and be quiet, right. Yeah. The more it gets hidden, buried away and calcified. Uh, and, okay. And now we don't calcified. even have. Wow. That's a, that's a strong word. Okay. Yeah. It gets right. calcified and now it can't even, it can't even find its way into your, you can't even get conscious access to it anymore, but you know what it does? It still has energy, still has life energy. So that's when you get the sabotage. That's when you get yourself doing and saying things. You go, why did I ever say and do that? Yeah. Oh. You ever notice that? Yeah. Uh, that's not me. How could I say something like that? Yeah. Like, well, that you have a calcified ego state that hasn't given, been given voice and you didn't have enough pressure on it to, to <laughs> cram it down anymore <laughs> and finally burst out and said <laughs> something that you're... Huh? Coup d'etat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll show you who's boss. <laughs> I'll show you who's boss. It's a little rebel now because it hates you for cramming it down in this prison all the time. And so it's going to sabotage you, you know, but if you get down to it, if you, if you lean into it, okay. then what happens is you get to the positive intent. And that's really important because when you first break open that calcified shell, yeah. you got a little rager in there that's just pissed off at you for, for imprisoning it, right? So this is scary work. The shadow work is what we call it, right? So that's what happens at 4.0. We start wanting to do the shadow work because we want to break open all these little prison cells. Yeah. And, and because every one of those is locked away energy. It's locked away capacity is a way to look at it. So the more you unlock them, the more capacity you have, okay? But as you unlock them, you, you know, they're going to be angry at the dictator ego who put them in the prison, right? 
It's like the feudal society, the king, you know, <laughs> that locks all the dissonance in the in the dungeon, you know, and they're not happy, you know. <laughs> So they get to come out and, and if you get to the positive intent, if you get below the rage and the resentment and the revenge orientation, you get to the positive intent. And the positive intent is usually, it's always, I've never seen it not be, a, some beautiful gift that you never realized that you had. And this is inside of you. These beautiful gifts are inside of you. And so what we do is we kind of gently crack open that shell, you know, and get to the positive intent. And now we have someone who's deeply compassionate and empathetic towards others while also being an amazing business leader. And what did they create now? So th this is what Terry's asked me to sit and work with you on. So I'm not, now I'm a little less intimidated. If you're gonna yeah. open that shell very gently and be huh? and, and, and yeah. very, very kind and soft as we move through all the calcifications huh? that's that are right <laughs> that's right and then this potential is going to merge and you and it becomes like little birthday party little surprises every time <laughs> the, the positive intent comes out and they come alive it's yeah. like oh my gosh i never even realized i had that inside me this is beautiful yeah. and 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 it, it it's so rewarding and then you end up living a very uh, very uh fluid life flowing life life just yeah. becomes more of a flow and, yeah. and it becomes easy and not work. And, and you're getting way more done. You're way more efficient, way more effective, but in a way that's just very fulfilling and just very flowing. This is, this is life as flow. Okay. Wow. And looking, you can get life as forward. flow right. if you got calcification. You can, you can <laughs> manufacture it in little moments, right? Oh, I'm in the flow. Now I'm not. Why is that? Well, it's because you got these calcified ego states that are saying, get me out of prison. <laughs> that's, that's why the book I wrote was written four steps to flow, not just flow. Huh? Yeah, yeah. The four steps are the calcifications. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Maybe the next book will be okay after you. You work with my calcifications, huh? so I'm yeah, looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> Super, sounds great, right, we have, wonderful. We have a few minutes left. We maybe we take a question and then, and then. so here is, how do, we, how do we define coaching leadership style? Will it be 4.5 style of leadership as per <clears> you? <throat> hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, we have coaches across the developmental spectrum. You know, we have yeah. coaches, oops, I don't know what happened. I, no, you're here. Hold on. You're here. Am I here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have coaches across the developmental spectrum. We have 2.5 coaches, 3.0 coaches, 3.5, 4.0, 4.5, 5.0, 5 5.5 coaches. You know, we have coaches across the spectrum. Um, and so you can't say what stage is the coaching in. Yeah. We have to say what stage is the person in yeah. and the way they bring the coaching out. Yeah. And so, uh, and that's what we do at, at stages. We actually have a coaching program and a coaching program for coaches. Yeah. And what we do is we bring coaches in, we, we teach them the different developmental styles of coaching yeah. and, and uh, we teach them how to coach without projecting. Everybody comes in and they think that they're free of projections. Every one of them has tons of projecting. <laughs> Believe me, if you're a coach or a psychotherapist, we have, not coach, had uh, one. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we have not had one come through that does, hasn't had their mind blown by how much they're projecting on their clients. We oh, think really? we're seeing our clients, but we are projecting on them so much. And we, we clean that all up so that when you yeah. go through the program, you are clean now. Okay. You are clean, absolutely clean. Now, just because you project doesn't mean you're not an effective coach. We have a lot of a very effective coaches that are projecting all over the place, but they're, they're doing really good anyway. Right. Okay. Okay. So that it's not, but, but if you can clean that up, so you're not projecting, it will supercharge your coaching. You'll even be even better at it. And then after we get the, the projections cleaned up, uh, then we uh, help them identify how to read the developmental level of the person in front of them. Okay. That's and okay. then adjust your coaching style to that, to that. Okay. Wow. Cause we have our coaching style. I'm going to use this coaching style with everybody. It doesn't work with them. There's something wrong with them. It's my coaching style is good. <laughs> I sounded like my leadership style pre cancer now. Just <laughs> yeah. Right. Just the exit button. Huh? <laughs> exactly. So now when you can read the person in front of you and go, Oh, they're coming from this developmental level. Oh, wait a minute. Now they're coming from this developmental level. Oh, now they're coming from this developmental. Level. Oh, now I'm getting the developmental range because we're not just in one, we tend to swing across yeah. a few. Now I got the range of this person and I know how to adapt my coaching to them. Okay. 
right? And now it can be effective because I'm not projecting on them, my development level, which just usually happens. Okay. I come from a 3.5, so I do 3.5 level coaching because I'm projecting on them that everybody's a 3.5, or I come from 4.0, so I project on everybody they need 4.0 style coaching when they actually need 3.5 or 3.0 or 2.5 level coaching. And now I'm just way over their head, and they're just they're just nodding their head and being nice, you know, but they're <laughs> saying you're Cause, crazy because 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 they're paying you, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so. So we tend to project our developmental level unconsciously onto our, onto our client. And so what we do at stages, we help clean up the projections. We teach you how to read the developmental level in the moment and then how to apply coaching to that developmental level. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Listen, Kim, we're way over time. But, okay. Uh, we're having so much fun. What are some thoughts, questions, reflections that you want to leave the families that are that are there there's people from stages as well that are that are on the call people are going to listen mm. later yeah. um, i know we're going to start working with the families we serve together which is going to be which is going to be really beautiful to really help them yeah. you know yeah. with where they are and and, uh -huh. and i think you know that for yeah. them it's it's the leadership but i think for a lot of them is is the personal side right is how do mm. i as a human being you know move from that active to passive as and when needed with my yeah. loved ones and, 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 and also, you know, it, it'll be more a balanced approach today. We talked a lot about leadership, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. uh, it'll be fun maybe to do another webinar to talk about the, the personal side of active versus passive. That, that might okay. be something we might want to consider just that to put it out there. Great. So I would be some, honored. So last, last closing questions, remarks, thoughts. Well, Depending upon your developmental level, I would give different advice. But for our 3.5 business leaders, if you find that you're great in business and your family's, you know, maybe a little upset with you, yeah. start going, what happens if I optimize my family life? What does it take? What kind of feedback mechanisms? What kind of a relationship do I have to get? Because they might be scared of giving me feedback, right? So what kind of a relationship do I want to create? What, you know, expand there. Start thinking about our thinking and thinking about our feeling. A lot of times our business leaders will think about their thinking, but they won't think about their feeling and they won't feel about their thinking. Yeah. I'm having this thought process. How does that feel? You know what? Actually, that doesn't feel good. It seemed like a good idea, <laughs> <laughs> but when I actually feel that idea, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Right. And if it doesn't feel good, that's part of your, that's a, a part of your whole being giving you signals that say, you know, if, if you go in that direction, it's not yeah. going to work out so well. And partly because you're not in alignment with all yourself. Yeah. And someone's going to start sabotaging because it doesn't yeah. feel good. There's something missing. We need to listen deeper. Okay. And when we listen deeper, we can create a vision that actually works for everybody internally and externally. Okay. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Kim. Thank you very much uh -huh. for honoring us this morning. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing and really walking us through all the different ideas. I mean, I learned a lot and I'm um, sure that uh, people who are listening now and who listen later will. And I'm really looking forward to our coaching together to crack open those little calcifications mm -hmm. and, yeah. <laughs> and, and turn them into little birthday surprises. Yeah. And, uh, at the same time, be of service to the families that we care for. It'll be really something, something beautiful. So really, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the days to come as we both be of service to to all of those that come our, come our way. Thank you so much, Vessel. It was an honor being here with you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. We're going to be back next week with, uh, um, with Samuel and Philip Markovici. He's going to talk about the experiences that the families have had during COVID. The week after that, Dominic is going to come in and he's going to talk about the narrative and how that affects and impacts family governance. And then we're going to have Ronald coming in the week after that to talk about leadership from the inside out. So very, you know, a little different, but still talking about, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that expression. So thank you everyone. Once again, thank you, Kim. So I wish you a good day. It's uh, 11 o'clock here. So we're going to now call it a night way past my bedtime, <laughs> <laughs> but it was more than worth it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And uh, see you soon and see everyone soon too. Thank you. Thank you much. Bye-bye.